Here's a question to get you thinking. Do you enjoy going to the dentist? How do you feel when you enter the exam room, twist into the chair, and kick up your legs one at a time? Under a bright overhead light, the dental hygienist lowers the back support on your chair. Down goes your head, up goes your feet. Lights, instruments, and equipment move before your eyes. Suddenly, there's a television on the ceiling, while everything else feels sideways. What sensations come to mind? What emotions? Though you may not have given it much thought, all of these problems involve vestibular processing. It's an issue that impacts adults going to the dentist, sure, but the effects actually begin much earlier in life and influence many aspects of development and performance. And here to talk with us about these issues today is Kathy Dan, occupational therapist on Colorado's Western Slope, based here in Grand Junction. Thanks for being here, Kathy. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's nice to be here. We were just talking about some questions to get the audience warmed up to the discussion that we're about ready to have. Do you want to go ahead and fire away on some of those? Sure. I would like to ask the audience, um, what do you think of when I say sensations? What is the first sensation that you remember having in your life? Well, I can, I know the audience is processing this. I guess the first thing that I would think of, gosh, that I could remember would go back to maybe being two or three. I would think of something, somehow perceiving the world around me through vision, um, something like that. Although I'm sure that's probably not the right answer. But while the audience is thinking on that, can you just talk to us a little bit about occupational therapy? So you're an OT. What is OT? What do you do? How would you describe this to parents who are maybe trying to explain to their child before their first session what to expect? Sure. Well, that's definitely a question that I've gotten a lot throughout my career. And um, basically, in a nutshell, occupational therapy practitioners um, work on engagement in meaningful occupations throughout the lifespan. So when we talk about children, their occupations include play, being a student, living in the home and getting along with others. So, you know, a lot of times people think it's a job, which would be more your vocation, but your occupation is kind of what you spend your time doing during the day. So for adults, you're a parent, you know, you're a worker, you're a caregiver. So for children, though, it definitely includes things like play, student, and learning how to be more independent. So basically, you, it sounds like you're talking about child development. You're helping the child do the development that they're supposed to do. Is that Am I right there? Yes. You know, definitely more development versus with adults, it might be redevelopment of things that they could do and then lost due to disease process or stroke or something like that. When you're talking about children, they are working on and learning to develop. So this is very much hands-on type stuff. You're you're, this is not a paper and pencil test. That's not what you're doing so much. You're, you're really working with the body and the, the, the eyes and the ears and all the senses and those things and how they work together, right? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So that's a great intro into OT. Um, going back to the initial questions that you'd asked, what are sensations and what are the first that you remember? Go ahead and enlighten us. I'm sure it's probably not vision like I thought. Well, it's funny because a lot of times things People think about pain, you know, um, I fell off my bike when I was a little kid or I was bitten by a dog or maybe they remember a taste, you know, something, a food, favorite food that they enjoy. But really, um, one of our very, very first sensations is what we call vestibular sensation or motion, the sense of motion. So the first sensation you likely had was your mother rolling over in bed or standing up, um, your ability to feel the sense of motion and the pull of gravity um, was developed around the 32nd week in utero and was fully functional around five months of life. This sense is part of the vestibular system, the invisible system. There are receptors and sensors in the inner ear. They're called the semicircular canals and the otolith organs. And this system provides support for everyday life occupations and actions. And there is significant quality of life issues when this system doesn't work efficiently. So 32nd week, that's what, like five months? Is that right? Uh, I don't know if my math is right. Somewhere around there. So that's that's in utero. That's before the child's even born. They're already experiencing this sense of movement yes. inside inside the womb. Yes, absolutely. There's other senses that develop in the womb. We can hear sounds and we feel touch. Of course, they've seen fetuses sucking their thumbs and 
they respond to the sense of motion and the sense of touch by then moving themselves you feel your infant kicking but yes so those senses start to develop very very early not to jump too much out in front of where we're going but how long or or to what age does vestibular continue to develop is that across the lifespan or is that kind of peak out around a certain well, age it kind of depends on what you what your background is and what your source of information is because there's a lot of different opinions on that um when an infant is born in by about the fifth month of age they do have what they consider to be a fully functional vestibular system meaning they are equipped to move on and learn how to roll over sit up eventually crawl and walk and that is due to that intact vestibular system an infant can tolerate being placed in various positions like on their belly on their back being lifted into space by their caregiver and not feeling insecure or lost okay that makes sense yeah i did a little research before the podcast and i I kept seeing a reference to balance for vestibular and, and, and head placement and head movement. Is that is that correct? Is that sort of what we can think of just very generally in terms of what vestibular is? Is it balance? and? I would say yes, that's very good. Um, to me, when I explain the vestibular system to my clients and my children, it's the sense of motion. Okay. It's the pull of gravity and your sense that you get when your head moves through space. So if you're riding in an airplane, you can tell when the plane speeds up or changes direction, makes a turn, because you feel that in your inner ear. You detect that or sense that in your middle ear. So yes. And you um, were sharing with me another example when we started the, the episode about being in a dentist's chair. Yes. As an adult, that might be an unsettling sensory experience. But yes, when you are put in the dentist's chair and they put you upside down and backwards, that can be pretty startling okay. to an adult. I want a child. Of course. And I want to ask you more about how vestibular problems can impact adults. But again, I'm jumping ahead just to get to the heart of why I think uh, many in the audience may be listening to this. How does vestibular impact child development and school performance? Sure. That's a really good question. Um, we touched a little bit on babies, but um, what, we, what we can see in babies and toddlers, um, sometimes babies might be a little bit floppy or they don't enjoy being picked up by their caregiver. They may arch their back and cry when they're picked up or when they're laid down for a diaper change. If it's every now and then they do that, that's kind of normal. But if it's constantly, it's every time they're lifted or every time they're put down for a cha diaper change and you see this rigidity or crying, fearful actions, reactions, that can be an indicator that there's some kind of processing problem going on. Toddlers who are late to acquire obvious development, developmental milestones, but not necessarily delayed. They're usually the kids who sit up toward the end of the range, more towards six or seven months versus four to five or six months. So they usually meet their milestones, but they're a little bit on the late side. In preschoolers, we'll see kids who are a little bit less stable and precise than their peers. Um, when it comes to moving on the playground, climbing, um, they'll fall out of their chairs and fall when they're running around. Mm. Um, that's combined also with the muscle and joint system or the proprioceptive system. But yeah, that can be an indicator of vestibular processing difficulties. So that. not necessarily a behavioral issue or an attentional issue. That's something else. Often, yes. Okay. And that is the main reason for referral to occupational therapy is children falling out of their chairs or throwing, appearing to throw themselves to the ground. Um, these children also get tired really easily with physical activity. They're working really hard to hold their bodies up in space and not fall over. So it makes it harder to do other things. By the time they make it to school, if they haven't had any obvious problems up until school age, they'll be squirmy. They'll have trouble sitting upright or paying attention, um, struggle with handwriting, and they might wa may want to avoid many school activities that involve writing. They'll do poorly in sports, and they'll constantly seek out intense motion with the way they play. And those signs often describe kiddos who have an underdeveloped sense of vestibular function or seeking. 
there's sort of the opposite end of the spectrum there is those who are oversensitive to the pull of gravity or the sense of motion. Um, and those are the infants we'll see who get distressed when they're picked up by their parent or laid down for changing. These kiddos who are oversensitive to vestibular input, by the time they're preschoolers, they're going to be overly cautious during play and the playground. They'll avoid rough play with their siblings and with pets. So in school, these children will often show a limited repertoire of play skills. And the things that they avoided earlier become more entrenched. And that can go on to affect friendships and other social relationships. And they'll avoid certain sports and play activities because they already know how hard it is for them to do it. Are you saying that the effects of vestibular delays or disorder, they're, they're global? across learning, social, um, behavioral? Absolutely. Wow. And there's not just what I'm telling you today, but lots of information that people can find if they did some searching on vestibular and social participation. Okay. And even other things, psychological issues. And before I use the wrong terminology, is there, what is this called when children have problems or struggles related to vestibular? Is, is this a vestibular disorder? Is it, um, what, what, what do you call that in the field? Well, there are a, a number of different things that can be, sometimes we'll see a diagnosis of sensory processing disorder. Um, there's also just parent and teacher reports of a clumsy child um, a child who, a shy child, uncoordinated discoordination. So those, there's a number of things. And when, a, when an occupational therapist looks at the different sensory systems, vestibular is usually one of the first that we look at and how vestibular input, whether it's circular or linear vertical, can affect a child's state of arousal and alertness. So... As they grow into young adults, also, there may be very limited physical activity, which can lead to health issues and continued lack of social participation. If you don't like motion, you're probably not going to move much. And so it can really contribute to things like a sedentary lifestyle and all the health issues that go along with that. Okay, you've talked about some of the indications of possible vestibular problems or delays and what to look for. Let, let me just build on that and, and ask you for some additional information if you have it. You mentioned that they may appear clumsy. They may fall out of their chair. They may evidence handwriting problems, which I did not know about. I knew with vision and perception and fine motor, but you're saying vestibular can also affect that. Obviously, behavior, whether they're sensory seeking or sensory avoidant. Are there any other things that parents and teachers should look for as possible signs of a vestibular problem? I think that if you're seeing these things in your children, it might be worth a discussion with the pediatrician and discussing that and having a therapy evaluation because the sensory systems that are, you know, we learn about the sensations in kindergarten. We learn about our sense of touch, our sense of sight, sound and taste and smell. And there are more, you know, we've talked about the sense of motion, which is the pull of gravity and the sensation we get when we move through space. There's also the movement sensation or what's called proprioception. And that is information that we get from our muscles and our joints, you know, things like how much pressure is on, are on, is on my feet. Am I standing up? Am I sitting down? It's sort of your body map. Uh, how fast am I moving? Which hand am I using? That information is proprioceptive. And so the sensory systems, especially of touch, movement, and motion, are very intertwined and then they also work very very closely with our visual system so it is kind of hard to separate each one out as if in a vacuum so children who have difficulties with vestibular processing likely have other issues with other sensory systems that combine together to produce these skills that we talk about like eye hand coordination 
you know, you need to see the ball and how fast it's coming towards you to catch it. You need to know where your hands are to bring them quickly together to catch it. And then you need to be upright and balanced enough to catch it. So see the systems work together. So it's hard to isolate them. There are tests and procedures that therapists use to sort of um, gather information about which systems children might be over-responsive in or under-responsive in and then direct their therapy to address those kinds of things. Okay. I'd like to ask you two questions that come to mind as I'm, as I'm listening to you. First of all, how do parents get referred to OT? If you can comment on that, whether it's from a pediatrician or school, if this is something they can undertake on their own, do they need a referral, et cetera, just so we can go ahead and get that figured out. And then maybe you can talk a little bit about how an OT assesses vestibular when that's a concern. Sure. So a good place to start for any kind of referral is your pediatrician because they have obviously a lot of knowledge about childhood and development and um, can make appropriate referrals based on what you're telling them about your child. Also, if they happen to be receiving services like through a counselor or a psychologist, a psychologist can also refer. Depending on what state you live in and your medical insurance, you might be able to just take your child to your local occupational therapist and get evaluated. You may not even need a referral, but that is based on different insurances. And then when they see somebody like you and you begin to do your initial assessment and and figure out what else may be going on and tease out some of this, how does vestibular assessment, what does that look like? Sure. Well, when we start with a child, in a sensory-based clinic, like where I'm at, um, I have certain things in my room, in my space, that are set out for the child. And usually I stand back and watch what the child gravitates toward or what they might avoid. In my clinic, I have a swing, a platform swing. The swing is king. I know. I was going to ask you about that slogan. And I also have a ramp. And I have lots of therapy exercise balls in different sizes and colors. There's a trampoline. There's a balance beam. There's large stuffed animals. So I kind of look to see what the child goes to first. And if a child is very comfortable in seeking vestibular input, they'll go right to that swing, climb on, and start going. And that's one way I can tell, okay, they like vestibular input. They like the sense of motion. Whereas if a child comes into my space and they don't go up to the swing, if I have to encourage a child to get on the swing, or if they act fearful, like say no, or run away from the swing, I immediately start to think, hmm, maybe we have a proper problem with their detection of the sense of motion. So the vestibular assessment begins a lot with just watching what the child does. I don't have the luxury here of observing them on a playground where I would in a school, but in my space, I can see, you know, then next I might invite them to sit on the slide and will they go down the slide or are they fearful there too? I have a little ladder in my room. Will they climb the ladder or not? So you can just start to see through play-based functional activities what a child likes to do and what they can't do. I guess that touches back on your explanation of what occupational therapy is. So if the child's occupation is playing, being in a classroom, um, living at home, doing the things that they do at home, that's what you're observing and you're able to see through their behaviors, whether they're seeking, avoiding how they treat these objects, you're able to pick up on that. Yes. And then when I see a child who wants to swing, so we'll swing for a while and we'll see how they do. Can they push themselves and how does their body react to being in different positions on the swing? I have a number of different swings in the therapy space, but the one that I usually start with is a platform swing. It's a square shaped piece of wood and the kids can sit on it, but they don't get any support. You know, they have to be able to sit on their own. They can hold on. But once that thing starts going, I can see if a child is floppy and flopping around and having a hard time staying on the swing. Can they move into different positions on the swing? Like if they start sitting on their bottom, can they transition to laying on their belly or getting on their hands and knees while that swing is moving in a slow, low arc, of course, not going top speed. But you can look, you can start to see a lot of information about their postural stability and their control and their fear or lack thereof. I was going to ask you, do most kids enjoy that regardless whether they're sensory seeking or avoidant or or are there some kids who just, they, they don't want to be on there at all? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. So in the sensory world, we often talk about um, modulation or regulating a sensory input. And that's usually over responsive to a sensory input or under responsive. And they're usually pretty easy to see. A child who's afraid of the swing, who's very overly responsive to vestibular input, they're very sensitive to that sense of motion. They're not even going to get on the swing and have their feet off the floor. They might sit on the swing on our first visit. It might take a couple of visits before they'll even sit on it with their feet on the ground in the, in the case of some child with gravitational insecurity. Whereas there's also, we talk about discrimination of sensory input. Is it light? Is it firm? Is it soft? Is it scratchy? Is it fast? Is it slow? So kind of grading how it feels is more of a discrimination or registration issue versus a modulating, like how much does it affect my level of arousal and alertness versus what is it perceiving it? Okay. So the swing is the therapy and their bodies are able to begin making adjustments through repeated therapy sessions, through practice on the swing. And then you see over time with say sensory avoidant kiddos, do they tend to be less resistant to getting on the swing? Do they start looking forward to their swinging motion? A lot of kids have just not had experience with swings. We work with a lot of young children here, and if they were born in 2020, they may not have been on a swing. Mm -hmm. um, we were locked down when they were infants, and even as young toddlers, and depending on their living situation, if they didn't have access to swings, so they can appear to be fearful and avoidant of swings when really it's just a lack of experience. So I would say for the most part, when kids come in, they do enjoy the swing, whether they have lack of experience or they do have vestibular processing deficiencies. They still enjoy it and they want to work it and they want to do it because it's, it's intrinsically motivating. And that's another big piece of, of the therapy is what is a child interested in? So the gravitationally insecure children take a little bit more time and we might do other vestibular activities instead of the swing with them, for example, bouncing on a therapy ball. So I have a ball that's sized for them and they can sit on it and bounce and get that up and down motion under their control and they start to feel comfortable with that sense of motion mm -hmm. and we can progress from there. Okay. I was going to ask you as my next, next question, we like to wrap up these podcast episodes with specific action steps or tips that parents can take today. We covered what to look for generally, how parents can approach um, or can ask for an OT assessment or find out if that's an option that's appropriate given what they're seeing in their child. And you mentioned talking to their pediatrician. Um, what are some things that parents can do or, stu or, or teachers or, or whoever who works with kids can do today to support their vestibular development? Maybe they have a problem with it. Maybe they don't. What are some things that are really easy that listeners to this podcast episode could do this afternoon? Sure. If your child isn't gravitationally insecure, which is fairly rare, you can take them to the park and let them get on the swings. Let them climb up and go down the slide. Go to the swimming pool. Uh, you can ha have them try out a trampoline and see how they like that, or even a large exercise ball, and, and see how they enjoy that, or a tricycle ride. Okay, as we finish up this podcast, I would like to ask you if there's any major takeaways that you would like to give the audience. I'll include all these exercises and other suggestions in the show note, but if there's one thing that they walk away from this podcast knowing, what would that be? The good news is that vestibular-based problems generally respond very well to therapy. And um, it's also important to remember that the vestibular system really does shape our identities in sub subtle but definable ways. Um, you know, it helps develop our sense of self, and subsequently our occupational choices and aspirations are shaped in part by these issues. So if you feel like your child really does struggle in some of these sensory areas, getting them evaluated sooner rather than later, children generally won't outgrow a sensory processing problem. They'll outgrow a pair of genes, but the sensory processing problems that they might be having as a toddler or an infant are likely to grow with them. And when we think about how that can shape 
the things that we avoid and the people that we associate with and the play and the sports that we either do or don't do because of these problems, we want to get that addressed earlier. Um, one of the things therapists really can help do also is reframe the behavior that we see in some of these children. They're not lazy, they're not troublesome, and they're not controlling. They may have pieces of that, but if there is a true sensory processing problem, a lot of those behaviors can be explained by, oh, they're just seeking out that kind of input, or, oh, they're avoiding it because they're afraid. The child is, is appreciated as genuinely experiencing difficulty when they seek or avoid certain sensory experiences. Okay, these seem like really great points, especially the fact that many of these issues drive behaviors that are due to a sensory problem and not um, a, a, a behavioral unwillingness or trying to be difficult or cause problems for themselves or anybody else. And if they do have those behavioral issues, a thorough sensory evaluation can help parents and physicians and teachers pick out which things are based on sensory and which things might be another issue that isn't necessarily having its basis in sensory processing. That's great. Well, what I got out of this episode is that vestibular is very important in child's development. It begins early. It continues to impact individuals throughout their lives. It, it impacts individuals in all sorts of ways, from their school performance to the way that they relate to the world with friends, places they go or don't go, sports they may be involved in or not. It sounds like there's not, um, th there's no too early of a time to get kids involved. I didn't say that correctly, but you can get kids involved in OT from an early age. Is yes, that right? from infancy, even preemie, even premature infants, especially because when a preemie is born, they aren't necessarily fully developed. If we're saying that the vestibular system is functioning at 32 weeks of gestation and they're being born around that time, they may not be fully developed vestibularly and be ready by five months of life. And so they can even use gentle vestibular motion techniques guided by an experienced therapist. So if you're a teacher or a parent with concerns, you don't need to wait. You can bring that to your pediatrician's attention and they can direct, they can give you some, some guidance about how to move forward. So that's, absolutely. Okay. That's great. Well, we could talk about this. I know for a long time, as well as all the other senses that you address in, in your occupation. So um, what I'd like to do is have you back on at some point and we can talk about those. I would love to do that. All right. Well, this has been great. Um, thanks for joining us. And uh, as I said, I'll include all this information in the show notes, including how to get a hold of Kathy, how to find out more information. Thanks for joining us. That's it from us today. As always, you can find more information as well as resources on our website, individualmatters.org. We hope you'll join us at the next podcast, where we'll continue to explore topics around successful living, learning and education, and child development, and share ways to help you live a more positive and fulfilling life.